This is C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a look at colonial myths and monuments. University of Delaware professor Zara Anna Hausalen says that assumptions about colonial America are strongly influenced by popular culture, including paintings and statues. So welcome. This is History 318, the history of colonial America, and I'm Professor Zara Innes Hanslin. Now, at the beginning of this course, I asked each of you to tell me what you think of when you think of colonial American history. Um, Many of you, I'm sure, don't even remember what you put, but I'm going to give you a little synopsis today. Many of you focused on what historians would actually call the American Revolutionary Era rather than the colonial era writ large. Um, People like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, issues like taxation without representation, other founders and historical highlights of the imperial crisis in the war all popped up. A few of you also mentioned places um, like historic Jamestown, Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts, and colonial Williamsburg. And a few people mentioned the history of slavery. And what I thought was really interesting was that it was notably because of um, either or the 1619 Project and the summer's Black Lives Matter protests. Um, But what was interesting was that there were a few omissions. No one mentioned individual women, I think, um, or any individual indigenous people by name. And no one, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, mentioned anything west of the Appalachian Mountains, um, much less west of the Mississippi or the Rockies or the West Coast. Now, technically speaking, this course runs from before contact of Europeans with indigenous people in the 15th century to 1763, the end of the Seven Years or French and Indian War, in what is now the territory called the United States of America. So obviously this covers hundreds of years, millions of lives, um, half of which were women, uh, coming together of people from Africa, mostly enslaved and um, not of their own volition, as well as multiple countries and empires in Europe, England being but one among these and not even the first to establish a permanent settlement as we've discussed, Um, as well as of course, um, indigenous people intermingling with Africans and Europeans on what is um, now the United States of America, but originally was all Indian territory, stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific and including Hawaii and Alaska. And in this course, we don't even cover the American Revolutionary Era. Um, and I did that on purpose because it tends to suck all the air out of the room. Um, I love the American Revolution. I teach a class specifically on that. Um, but it does tend to overshadow the rest of the colonial era if it's included. Um, and yet, most of you, like most Americans, I think, When asked to think on what colonial American history means to you, um, you thought about a few white men in the 13 seaboard colonies um, of the Atlantic coast who signed the Declaration of Independence and fought the American Revolution. This makes complete sense. Um, Most of us, I think, unless we take advanced history courses or do a lot of outside reading, have a pretty narrow conception of what colonial America is. Um, You might remember we had a very memorable um, example of um, one of your classmates showing a Halloween costume that was pretty laughable, but I think typical of how Americans picture the colonial past. Um, There are a lot of silences about the colonial past in contemporary America and how we remember it. And I hope that this course has changed that for you. Um, And spoiler alert, one of the things we're going to do next week is I'm going to ask you to answer the same question so we can compare and contrast where we began in our conception of colonial American history and where we are now near the end of the course. Um, And so I think though the relatively narrow conception most Americans have of what colonial American history even is, is one of the reasons why we spent our first few weeks defining what the course means. Um, So in other words, uh, we talked about what does colonial mean? What does American mean? um, And what is history? And we'll return to those discussions next week too. And a lot of these are actually pretty controversial, um, notably the word American, right? Um, America encompasses um, North America, South America. People in Latin America um, take issue, understandably, with um, U.S. citizens referring to ourselves as American. We sort of co-opted that that phrase. Um, And what does history mean? Who's in charge of fashioning it? Um, And whose whose interpretation of the past do we we focus on? Um, But in the meantime, today's lecture is going to be a chance to connect a lot of the dots of the last weeks we've spent thematically learning together on everything from the Salem witch trials to Virginia in 1619, um, to gender and religion and war. And to use our reading in particular of Michelle Rolf Trio's book, Silence in the Past, Production, Power in the Production of History, which you're finishing up this week and next, to think about the history of colonial America and how that history is created, communicated, and memorialized 
not just inside academic circles and books, but out in the broader public. And two ways in which the concepts of colonial American history are popularized in these ways are the subjects of today's lecture, and that will be myths and monuments. And now I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, so I began the, uh, so far so good, right? We're all still here. I began the course um, by introducing, introducing you to, I think, one of the most critical concepts that I hope students who study history in college walk away from my courses with. And that's that history is not the same thing as the past. Um, history is not just a recitation of facts, dates, etc., that happened in the past, but people's interpretation <clears throat> of those dates, of those facts. Um, and sometimes, of course, people believe in history that's not even based on facts at all, hence the myth part of this lecture. Um, but when it comes to the history of colonial America, I think how we define um, the terms about which we're speaking is critically important. Um, for example, whose past are we discussing? When does it begin? Where is it situated? Um, these sound like basic questions around a history course, but they're not. And what encompasses colonial American history and how we define it has shifted over time. Um, and how we choose to interpret this colonial American past matters to the American present because it does, um, it does include answers to the questions of what and who do we celebrate, who or what do we silence, um, and what people and places and events do we count as important in the past. Um, now, myths and monuments do a lot of this work. Um, and they do it in a variety of ways, of course, outside college courses. This is one of the reasons, uh, pedagogical insight here, one of the reasons why, <clears throat> in addition to studying primary sources, I asked you all to look into historical interpretations of the colonial American past. So, you know, everything from the names on street signs to Disney films to Halloween costumes to historic sites like Colonial Williamsburg, which you see pictured here, and of course, monuments um, to people, which we've discussed um, and will continue to discuss today. And I think uh, Trio puts it really nicely in Silencing the Past. And I quote here, history has many hearths and academics are not the sole teachers, history teachers in the land. So in other words, um, people get their history from a wide variety of places. Um, history is produced outside of universities as well as within them. Um, and the history of how our understanding of colonial American history is constructed necessitates in particular, I think, that we consider history and historiography not just within but beyond the academy. Um, people do get a bigger dose of colonial American history when they go to Colonial Williamsburg or Plymouth Plantation in many cases than they do um, than they do in their choices of reading or some of their um, certainly K through 12 um, history courses. So history, especially popularly consumed history, often takes this material form. And one reason we need to study objects, artifacts, and places, historic sites, as well as art, what I would think of loosely grouped together as um, what scholars call material culture, is that it's a really great way to understand the production and consumption of history. And I think this is one of the reasons why Trouillot um, spends a great deal of time in his, in his book talking about um, history that's not just in books, right? History that's found in places like Sans Souci, um, in statues, um, in Haiti examples, as examples. Um, and of course, debates around monuments, of which we've seen a lot in the last few years, but a lot in particular this summer, um, debates about monuments and public art, um, whether they should stand or fall, um, what should be erected in the first place, are of course actually debates about history, um, which itself is a form of monumentalizing um, and commemorating. And uh, what I want to talk about today is how um, the stories we don't tell, um, the stories we silence, are just as important as the stories we tell. And that really when we silence stories, it's kind of like staring, uh, tearing down statues in a sense. Um, and so when it comes to colonial America, um, historiography shapes not just how the past is interpreted, but the parameters um, that we put around discussing that past as well. Um, whose past is it? When does it begin? Where is it situated? Um, this is this is complicated, um, but the celebrations of it rarely are. And I think um, Trio's quote here is, is a really great one, again, from the book that you read, um, the section that you read from this for this week. The myth-making process does not operate evenly. Celebrations are created, and this creation is part and parcel of the process of um, the historicization of, of production, his, histor, historicity's production. So in other words, um, 
we make choices with monuments, with celebrations like Columbus Day, just as we make choices um, in terms of what to put in our history books. And these commemorations, these celebrations are usually pretty sanitized in the sense that they're usually pretty simplistic, right? Um, monuments tend to offer a very simplistic narrative, um, an easily understood one, a pretty black and white one. And we know from class in our discussions that history is hardly ever a matter of black and white. Um, it's usually various shades of gray. Um, it's complicated is the answer to a lot of the questions that we pose about the colonial past. But um, think about monuments. How many are there that have things inscribed at their base, like to the memory of both sides of a complicated, messy past, right? Um, they usually represent uh, the victor or um, you know, the person in control of the narrative about the past. Um, so how we choose to interpret the American colonial past matters to the American president and what and who we celebrate and what or who we silence, um, we can see in the places and spaces around us. Um, and I think, for example, just to take one of the things we wrestled with in the early weeks of the class, um, when do we begin colonial America is really critically important. And it's such a seemingly simple question, but it's so hard to answer. Um, and yet the answer predetermines to a large extent how we view colonial America. Um, we talked, for example, about whether we should begin our concept of colonial America before contact between um, European and indigenous peoples, um, whether concepts like prehistory to describe um, indigenous histories before European arrivals, um, actually do a disservice to the richness of the indigenous past. Um, you know, the idea that we should we should look at um, at the historical artifacts and structures left behind by Mississippian mound cultures like that you see in the middle here um, as as just as valid as um, as written histories that European peoples tend to leave um, behind. And yet we refer to indigenous histories as prehistory in a lot of cases. Um, and what happens after contact is history. Um, if we start in 1776 um, with, you know, uh, thinking about America, then that defines America as always around this nation state of the United States of America, when in fact, um, there are hundreds of years of history that come before that in which it was by no means predetermined that uh, the United States of America would ever be a thing that came into being, right? Um, similarly, we discussed a lot about um, dates that are important as starting points traditionally in how we talk about colonial American history and what we should do with that. 1492, of course, um, the idea that uh, Columbus, um, Columbus discovering is often the word used, but we've discussed how that word um, does the history a disservice um, because it's about contact and then conquest, not about discovering something um, that, of course, was well known to the uh, many, many, many people who lived there before Columbus stumbled upon it. Um, but, you know, 1492 is a beginning point. Um, or do we begin with um, 1607, the first permanent English settlement at Jamestown, Virginia? But, of course, this ignores the fact that the English weren't the first European powers to establish a permanent settlement in what is now the United States of America at all. Um, those were the Spanish in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, and Or was it 1619, um, Jamestown, uh, the arrival of um, Africans who um, became the first enslaved Africans in an English permanent settlement, or um, the uh, the establishment of the House of Burgesses, or is it 1620 with um, the Pilgrims' arrival in Plymouth? So these are all various options, right? Um, and in part, one of the reasons that I spent so much time with us discussing issues like when does colonial America begin, when does America begin, is that I think it helps us to determine um, what we discuss, um, who we celebrate, and who we raise monuments to, among other things. And um, getting to um, why these choices are important, I think they're really important because, um, as Trio says, celebrations straddle the two sides of historicity. They impose a silence upon the events that they ignore, <clears throat> and they fill that silence with narratives of power about the event they celebrate. So in other words, one reason I have you read Trio in the first place um, is so we can discuss the man whose myth and monuments we're going to begin with today. Um, a man who, as you know, never stepped foot on what is now the United States of America, but who regularly nevertheless begins our surveys of its past. And that is, of course, Christopher Columbus, um, who got a lot of attention this summer and has for a while due to um, the holiday celebrating him, uh, Columbus Day, which has, um, which has gotten a great deal of pushback um, for uh, Columbus and his reputation, right? So there's Columbus the man, there's Columbus the myth. And a lot of the monuments, of course, celebrate Columbus the myth. Um, 
but we can talk about Columbus the man as we have in this course. And um, I think one of the reasons that Columbus the myth has gotten a lot of pushback is uh, more and more people have become aware of why exactly he deserves um, analysis and critique um, from his enslavement of indigenous people, from his very first um, point of contact in the Americas um, to the raping, disfiguring and killing of Indian people done um, at his command in, in the name of the pursuit of profit, specifically gold in the Caribbean. Um, and yet he's celebrated, and we've discussed this too, um, as the sort of uh, kickstart of the chain of events that led to um, the establishment of European colonies in, um, in North and South America and the Caribbean, that without which, of course, the United States of America would not be here in its present iteration. And um, one of the things that's a common response to critiques of the actions of people like Columbus, whose actions we now condemn as deplorable in many ways, um, is that he was a man of his time, right? Um, and we discussed this too, and the fact that um, there were always people who stood against atrocities such as those that Columbus ordered, participated in, um, notably indigenous people themselves at the time, right? They did not approve of what he was doing, but also other Europeans at the time. Um, and we've discussed the Dominican friar and historian um, uh, de las Casas, um, a former former enslaver himself who also um, participated in um, in the 1513 um, invasion of Cuba, um, but all, who came to have a change of heart um, in part as a priest and in part uh, as someone who believed that the treatment of indigenous people was, was wrong. Um, and then uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Baca, who uh, journeyed in what is now Florida and Texas in the 1520s and 1530s um, with Alongside him was the enslaved African Esteban, um, which is an interesting interesting point of um, contention some historians have made with the 1619 project, um, which which touts the first arrival of uh, of enslaved Africans when um, in fact Esteban was was there in Florida and in Texas the century before. Um, and yet, you know, despite the fact that critics uh, and and Devaca also like like De Las Casas. Um, at, beseeched his fellow Spaniards to treat indigenous people better, um, to not enslave them, and to treat them better than than Columbus um, Columbus had done, for example. Um, and yet, despite pushback in his own time and since, um, we have so many reminders of Columbus, not just in statues like these, um, which you see in Philadelphia at the left, which has not been defaced in part because, um, because men stood around it and protected it this summer, so it wouldn't be... Um, wouldn't be defaced, um, just showing you the strong emotions that people have for as well as against Columbus. Um, the Statue of Columbus in San Francisco in the middle, which has been splashed with red paint, which is often something that um, protesters use to to um, deface monuments um, that they of historical figures they feel have blood on their hands. Um, and then on the right, um, a statue I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about, um, Statue of Columbus in, in a park called Bird Park in Richmond. Um, that was toppled this summer and put into a pond that's in the lake. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this statue of this monument of Columbus in Richmond, because I think it gets us at, um, at how Columbus is really just a starting point um, for our discussion of monuments and myths and their power um, in how we view colonial American history, um, especially scattered throughout our landscape. So I mentioned that um, the statue of Columbus that was, that was put in the pond in Richmond is um, is in a park called Bird Park. So Bird Park, it's B-Y-R-D, um, not like a songbird, but uh, like this man, William Bird II, who's shown here in his <clears throat> 1724 portrait. Um, Bird Park named for a family of Virginia colonists who um, grew quite wealthy, um, owned a lot of property. And William Bird II, um, whose portrait you see here, is the, one of the, the Bird family who helped to found the city of Richmond in the 1730s and who owned a lot of the property upon which the city of Richmond was, was built. So Bird Park is named for him um, as a founder of the town of Richmond. But um, this is something that I think is important to note because when the Columbus statue was toppled um, this summer and put in the water in Bird Park, um, a lot of the focus was on Columbus and what Columbus um, tells us about colonial American history. No one really talked about William Byrd, um, for whom the park is named. And I think it's really important to bear in mind that how we monumentalize the past, how we memorialize colonial America, is, is just as powerfully found in the names of parks and streets as it is um, in things like a monument, like a statue. 
And in some ways, these are more important because these are just as hard to topple. Um, people are very attached to the name, names of things. Um, and if we think about Christopher Columbus, if we were going to go about uh, tearing down everything related to the man, we would have to rename, among other things, our capital city, uh, Washington, the District of Columbia, um, which is something that comes out of Columbus's name. So what do we do about William Byrd II? Um, if you think about William Byrd II, and you start to learn more about him, um, you really have to question whether his name should grace that of a park um, in which um, people people gather uh, to enjoy themselves. William Byrd II, um, as I mentioned, very wealthy. He was also very erudite, um, had a fabulous library, um, wrote a number of books, um, including his secret diaries, which he wrote in code, um, which have been cracked by historians. And in his secret diaries, um, he records his serial philandering. Um, he was married twice, um, but he continued to, um, to have multiple sexual affairs, many of which were rapes of enslaved women, all of which he details um, in his diaries. Um, he also uh, had some terrible habits of, um, of interaction with enslaved people uh, whom he claimed as property. One enslaved man, for example, um, had a habit of wetting the bed at night and as punishment once William Byrd II made him drink his own urine after he'd wet the bed. So not at all an attractive figure, quite the contrary, um, sort of representing the worst of um, Virginia colonial aristocracy. Um, and yet his name is, um, is what this park in Richmond, Virginia um, is, is named, is, the park is named for him. And so when we think about um, monuments like that of Columbus in Bird Park that are toppled, I think we need to think about um, the wider connections that the, the name of Bird Park itself is also important. So what do we do with that? And as I said, where do, where do we draw the line with our questioning of these myths and monuments? Um, because, of course, um, it's at a certain point, things are so entangled, it's really difficult to separate them out. Um, Columbus, for example, Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. Columbus is celebrated in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, you see the Capitol there at the top left. Um, the Capitol Rotunda has um, eight epic paintings within it. These enormous paintings you can go and see, um, sort of a popular public tour of the Capitol. Four of them uh, commemorate things from the Revolutionary Era. They're by Jonathan Trumbull, and they celebrate um, the Revolution, the founding period. The other four um, are from the 19th century, and they are described um, by the U.S. Capitol um, historians as, quote, four scenes of early exploration in the United States. Now, these are interesting word choices because these depict things like um, this painting, which is um, The Landing of Columbus by John Vanderlyn, um, completed, installed in 1847, commissioned by Congress in 1836. Um, they also include uh, DeSoto's expedition uh, in the Mississippi, um, Mississippi Valley, and um, the baptism of Pocahontas, which we'll see in a moment. In other words, they depict scenes that arguably could be called not early exploration, but scenes of dispossession, um, scenes of contact and then conquest and dispossession of indigenous people from their lands. Um, or in the case of Pocahontas, as we'll discuss, um, dispossessing her from her from her own culture in in interesting ways, interesting and in, and in, um, ways that have been critiqued by scholars of indigenous history. So, what does this mean that these that these images are in the U.S. Capitol rotunda? It means that what's being celebrated in the U.S. Capitol, uh, what's being monumentalized through the public art, um, is not just the founding period, but also what happened in the 19th century that gets wrapped up in. Um, Indian removal um, and in the concept of manifest destiny of the United States fulfilling a God-given right to spread across the U.S. continent from Atlantic to Pacific, um, really arguing that Columbus and DeSoto um, and other early explorers and um, people from uh, European empires who, who come and conquer the land and its and its indigenous peoples are are really something to be celebrated in American culture. Um, and these don't just stay in the capital, these paintings. Um, these paintings also end up on the uh, the backs of 19th century currency. Um, this, for example, this painting of the landing of Columbus um, was used not just on um, on a banknote issued in the 1870s, but also um, on two stamps in the 19th century. Um, and similarly, 
if we look at one of the other of those four paintings um, from the 19th century in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda, uh, we see here the Baptism of Pocahontas by John Gatsby Chapman. Um, this was um, completed in 1840, and like the Columbus, the landing of Columbus by Vanderlyn, it also um, appeared on the reverse of money um, issued in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, and it shows a ceremony um, in which Pocahontas, uh, daughter of Powhatan, um, is baptized and given the name Rebecca um, in the Anglican Church at Jamestown, which we've, um, which we've talked about. Um, and this ceremony took place in 1613 or 1614 in Jamestown, um, and Jamestown, of course, we've discussed, is celebrated as the first permanent English settlement on the North American continent. Um, and so this is something that obviously the U.S. Capitol um, is celebrating, even though, um, as we know, it's not the first permanent European settlement in the Americas. Um, and Pocahontas is often touted as being the earliest native convert to Christianity in, the, in one of the permanent English colonies. Um, and so this is something that is seen as a success story, right? The idea that, um, that uh, Europeans uh, are going to come over and convert indigenous people to Christianity is something that is at the heart of many imperial endeavors, um, English, Spanish, French, um, as, as three notable ones we've discussed in this course. Um, and so the idea then that Pocahontas should be celebrated for, um, for sort of renouncing her, her cultural heritage, right? For um, becoming English in many important ways, um, becoming Christianized is what's being celebrated um, in this painting. Um, so again, a sort of form of, of cultural dispossession, I would argue, um, that's being celebrated. And of course, as we know, the real Pocahontas versus the um, stylized one in the Capitol Rotunda, or even worse, the Disney princess, with which we're familiar that you see on the top left, um, had, um, had a much more complicated history. Um, she was probably more of uh, what historians call a go-between, um, a skilled interlocutor um, between indigenous and English people um, responsible for, for you know, making connections, cultural connections, as well as um, important connections through her marriage to um, English settler John Rolfe um, that cemented ties um, in important ways in this critical, this critical early decade of Jamestown settlement. Um, and yet the Capitol Rotunda painting celebrates her for her conversion to Christianity. Um, and here you see the actual Pocahontas who looks uh, quite different from the romanticized version in either the Rotunda or Disney um, in the only surviving known portrait of her, which shows her of course, as not looking indigenous at all, as looking um, very much like, um, like a European and English woman um, wearing lots of expensive finery, um, including lace and a feather likely to um, stand in as a symbol of her exotic Indian origins and European eyes, <clears throat> a velvet, a richly expensive um, metallic thread embossed um, embroidered velvet uh, jacket and super expensive lace around her neck, as well as, of course, um, something we've discussed, um, a hat most likely made of beaver pelt, which um, will prefigure the very, very lucrative trade in um, beavers as a commodity that come to define a lot of interactions between indigenous people and European settlers in the 16th and 17th century. Um, so one of the things that um, that is interesting, though, to point out about Pocahontas um, and her her persistent presence um, as a myth and a monument in, in our understanding, our collective understanding of the American colonial past is that she's one of the very few women who we even know um, or celebrate her name as an individual. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think any of you, and it's totally understandable why, um, mentioned an actual individual woman in your um, discussion of what pops to your mind uh, when you think of colonial American history, that first week of class. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not accidental um, that there's a connection here between the number of monuments that are erected to women from uh, women from any time period in America and how often women populate our, our common historical understandings. Um, less than 10% of those um, of the figures in Statuary Hall, which is also in the U.S. Capitol and um, has two statues from every state, so 100. Um, less than 10% of those are women. Um, and less than about 10% of all the outdoor monuments in America, 
um, are women. And um, of course, women have never just been 10% of the population. So there's obviously a big gap between historical reality and what we're choosing to memorialize about the past in America. Um, so one of the women who does have a number of monuments um, in America is a uh, a woman who became, again, like a lot of these figures, really popularly celebrated long after her death, um, in this case, popularized in the 19th century in particular, um, actually around about the same time in the 1860s and 70s that um, is when her monument started to, to pop up, that, um, that images of the baptism of Pocahontas and the landing of Columbus um, appeared on the back of U.S. currency. Um, so all these things, again, are entangled and in, in working together to push the same cultural narrative, um, the same historical narrative. So um, Hannah Dustin, who is pictured here in two of the um, monuments, um, she has a number of monuments erected to her, um, most of which, as I mentioned, put up in the 19th century, a few in the early 20th century, one in the early 20th, 20th century, rather. Um, she is also the woman who is the earliest publicly funded monument um, of a woman in the United States, um, and that's her monument in New Hampshire, um, a close-up of which you see on the left. Um, and this is I think an interesting choice that tells us a lot about um, what Americans were choosing to commemorate and celebrate about their colonial past uh, in the 19th century, um, because Hannah Dustin is, um, is a colonial Massachusetts um, you know, Protestant woman and mother who was taken captive by Abenaki Indians from, um, from Quebec during King William's War in 1697. So King William's War was one of this, um, one of the series of these wars we've discussed in this class quite a bit. Um, these wars between indigenous people um, pivoted around um, competing claims that French and English um, imperial interests had uh, for North American territory and, of course, um, clashing, clashing interests among Native peoples as well that intersected with all of these. So, um, as we've discussed, uh, people are taken captive in these Indian wars. Hannah Justin was one of these. Um, and she was taken captive along with her newborn daughter. Um, along the march from Massachusetts um, to New Hampshire, where she ended up um, while captive, um, the indigenous people who captured her killed her daughter, who was only six days old, um, by smashing her head against a tree, as Hannah Justin recalls it. Um, while captive in, in New Hampshire, um, Hannah Justin sort of, uh, in a very grisly fashion, returns the favor. Um, she's taken captive, not just with her infant daughter, but also with um, the woman who was helping to nurse, um, nurse her through her pregnancy and um, recovery from the birth. Um, and when they arrived in this island in New Hampshire, where um, they were stopping uh, with the people who had taken um, her captive. Um, she, Hannah Dustin, along with um, along with the other woman with her, and Samuel Lenerson, who was uh, was a boy who a teenage boy who had been um, captured separately. Um, the three of them decide to rise up in the night and free themselves. Um, which is understandable. Um, what they do next is slightly less understandable to contemporary um, points of view. Um, they decided to, um, to rise up and kill and scalp um, 10 Native Americans, including uh, two men, two women, and six children, um, and returned with the scalps um, as, as bounty. And in fact, um, uh, not only returned with the scalps as proof of what they'd done, but petitioned the Massachusetts um, authorities, the legislature, to pay them for the scalps, which in fact they did. Um, and so not only is, is this moment um, celebrated at the time and um, the scalps of these Indian men, women, and children is rewarded with money from um, the Massachusetts government. Um, Hannah Justin is celebrated enough so that she does have these statues erected to her. And of course, this also was defaced um, this summer, a reminder that um, you know women, women are complicit in these complicated pasts as well as men. So the last thing I wanna to touch upon um, is this final example is um, how we, sometimes turn bits of the landscape into monuments um, as ways to remember the colonial American past. Um, and here, of course, you see Plymouth Rock, which is something that um, was familiar, I think, to most, if not all of you before this course. Um, a number of you mentioned, mentioned the Pilgrims, mentioned Plymouth specifically, mentioned Puritans and New England in your responses about what you think about when you think about colonial America. Um, and I think that this is, uh, this is something that's worth diving into a little bit. So um, you'll start to see an emerging theme here in terms of monuments to the colonial past. Um, 
Plymouth Rock was not identified as or tagged as such or seen as important actually until the mid 18th century. Um, so it's not like in 1620 um, when uh, when the pilgrims landed in Plymouth, they they took out a chisel and, and carved the carved the year into the rock. Um, this was something that was done later. Um, it wasn't until the mid 18th century that um, that a descendant of of those uh, pilgrims pointed to the rock as important um, because it was in danger of being obscured by some new construction. Um, and so this is, again, one of these moments where much after the fact, people decide to commemorate and celebrate this element of the past. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, that Plymouth Rock is important in our national conception of who we were as a colonial people um, is because I think it speaks to something that we like to celebrate about the past. Um, the past is full of terrible, dreadful, uh, often depressing things that happened. Um, but it's, it's also a place where, um, where people as human beings strive to make their worlds better, to make themselves better, um, and leave, in some cases, uh, beautiful things behind. And I think one of the reasons people like discussing um, the pilgrims is that, um, although, of course, there's the flip side, which we all just discussed at Thanksgiving of, again, Indigenous um, attempts to dispossess Indigenous people of their land, um, armed conflict and um, killing of Indigenous people, um, spreading of disease, etc. But the pilgrims also speak to something that um, many people like to celebrate about America, which is as a place uh, to seek freedom from religious persecution, something that's very important to uh, conceptions Americans have of um, not just American culture, but also American law. Um, there's a reason that um, freedom, freedom to practice religion is, is First is first among the rights listed in the Bill of Rights to the U.S. Constitution. And I think in some ways, Plymouth Rock is a way to celebrate that, this idea that these people who were beleaguered and, um, and uh, persecuted for their Protestant religious faith um, in Europe were able to come and carve out a new, a new place for themselves um, in, in, this, in this New England um, and of course, we also have discussed uh, the importance of the Mayflower Compact, right? This sort of tiny seed of, um, of people agreeing to come together to communally govern themselves. Um, all of which, of course, does, does leave a lot out of the story as well. That's, again, an oversimplification. But so there is this, this element to Plymouth Rock that I think um, appeals to people for that reason. Um, but it's interesting to think about why we celebrate this particular part of American history, why we focus so much on it, um, why we focus so much of our collective attention when we think about the colonial past on these 13 seaboard colonies. In particular, I would argue New England um, and Virginia get outsized attention. And why is this? Why do we focus so much on this? Because, of course, um, so much of colonial American history uh, is unfolding. Um, obviously, most, most, um, most precisely with the vast array of indigenous people who are living um, and occupying this territory in the time period, but also um, the diverse array of European um, colonizers and settlers who are also there. Um, you know, we've discussed how the French are um, up and down the Mississippi River, the Spanish are in what is now Texas, Florida, California. Um, you know, you have all of these groups of, of people, European, American, um, indigenous people, as well as, as enslaved Africans um, coming together in these spaces. But why is it that we spend so much time on this teeny tiny part? Um, and I've shown you the teeny tiny part of, um, of the territory there with the blow up of Plymouth um, on the right, uh, as compared to the, the continental United States there. Um, why is it we spend so much attention on this, this tiny element of, of this seaboard colony. Um, and I think it's important, um, this is one reason why um, we use Alan Taylor's American Colonies as our textbook of sorts in this course, because Taylor is um, rightly, correctly, and I think um, with, with a lot of explanatory power, tries to situate American colonial history in a continental rather than just an East Coast, um, East Coast, East Coast parameter. And I think it's important that even if we're talking about um, the history of, of religious freedom of people's people's desire to um, to to pursue the freedom to practice religion as they wish um, that much like the history of colonial America is not just an East Coast one but a continental one um, we should also remember that the history of um, of 
people in America struggling to practice their religious freedom is not just an English or a European one. And to put this in context, um, I'm going to take us back. I'm going to stay with, with the Puritans, but take us back to, to the U.S. Capitol, um, this time to Statuary Hall, um, and talk a little bit about the man on the right, who is one of the few actually colonial figures celebrated in um, Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol, and that is the figure of uh, Pope, who is a Pueblo Indian, um, and Pope is is shown holding um, holding some knotted knotted ropes there, and those are um, integral to the story. I'm going to tell you about uh, why he's celebrated to this day. Um, to put this in context, um, in 1630, John Winthrop, whose portrait you see there on the left, uh, came to Massachusetts, to New England, um, in the first wave of what has been called the Great Migration, um, this sort of wave of Puritan settlement. Um, the 1620 Pilgrim was episode was a much smaller um, blip, but under John Winthrop, um, Puritans have a large, um, a large mass migration to New England, um, and to spread out throughout the land. Um, and Winthrop also is famous for, um, in 1630, coming over to Massachusetts uh, and talking about the America being, uh, their settlement in America being as, as a city upon the hill uh, for, the, for the world to marvel at, um, which is uh, that rhetoric of a city on a hill is, is, a, is a sort of bit of American mythology that has perpetuated um, and persisted, um, often referenced by U.S. presidents. Ronald Reagan was fond of it, for example, um, well into the present day. Um, and yet we learn about John Winthrop and the Puritans um, in 1630. We don't learn as much about the man who was born around 1630, um, who's to his right, which is Pope. Just like we spend a lot more time in, in Massachusetts than we spend um, in the American Southwest. So Pope, though, um, like Winthrop and the Puritans, um, wanted to practice his religion, um, wanted to practice it in freedom, um, was not allowed to practice it the way he wanted to by the authorities um, who were in power, again, just like the Pilgrims and the Puritans. In this case, though, the authorities in power are the Spanish Catholics, um, who in uh, 1675 arrest him along with, um, with almost 50 other Pueblo Indians for practicing their traditional Pueblo religion. Um, and in fact, they were charged with witchcraft by the Spanish, uh, which shows you how the Spanish view indigenous spiritual practices um, in the 17th century. So a, a few of them were hanged, um, but, but the rest, including Pope, uh, were brought to Santa Fe in what is now New Mexico and whipped publicly. Um, and so what you have here is a man who, by all accounts, is very charismatic, who's transformed by this um, this experience, um, this this public punishment, this persecution for his spiritual beliefs, um, and conspires to start the Pueblo Revolt, um, which becomes actually the most successful Indian revolt um, in American history. Um, and the knotted the knots in those ropes are the very clever communication system that they came up with to um, pass word about when the revolt should begin each day a knot was untied and that by the time that the, the uh, ropes passed around with no knots it was meant to be the day it started didn't quite happen that way because um someone was apprehended but nevertheless despite the false start it still was the most successful indian revolt in history pope and his um his Indian allies managed to kick the Spanish out of Santa Fe completely and occupy it um, from 1680 to 1692. Um, so an important reminder that um, fight for religious freedom is not just among European settlers. Um, there's an indigenous story here too. And to get back to Plymouth Rock, I want to leave with this idea, um, which is, you know, why do we, why do we study Plymouth Rock in our conception of colonial America more than we study um, something like newspaper rock. Um, an example of which there are many, there are many elements to um, the collection of rocks with these, um, these petroglyphs on them in um, current day Arizona, New Mexico. This is one in Arizona called newspaper rock um, and petroglyphs that have been carved over thousands of years by Pueblo Indians, um, indigenous people in this place. Um, Pueblo Indians like Pope um, as, as ways to, to um, leave traces of their family or clan symbols, um, offer spiritual interpretations, um, and to keep a calendar. Um, so just like Plymouth Rock could be seen as all of these things, right? Um, a way to leave a family or clan symbol, um, the, the mark of the Puritan, um, the Puritan migration, spiritual meaning certainly, because this is a, um, a place where um, where the pilgrims are memorialized for their settlement uh, 
to pursue freedom from religious persecution in Europe and calendar events, right? 1620 is a year. So what I'm saying here is that these rocks that are created by indigenous people on the one hand and European settlers on the other um, perform very similar tasks in terms of being monuments upon the land um, that human beings are celebrating in what is now the United States of America. So why is it um, that we tend to focus almost exclusively on things like Plymouth Rock and the related stories of those 13 seaboard colonies than we do on, um, on stories like Popeyes and like, um, like Newspaper Rock, monuments such as Newspaper Rock. Um, why don't we include both more often? Um, what, I'm like to, what I'd like to suggest um, as I end here is that I think that um, America, which has um, been, been dubbed vast early America by, um, by Karen Wolf, the director of the Omaha Hunter Institute of Early American History and Culture. Vast early America is so much more interesting than um, seaboard 13 original colonies in America. Um, it encompasses those 13 colonies, certainly, but there's a lot more we can learn about the past. Um, why not have a vast history that mimics the vastness of early America itself? So I'm looking forward to some questions, which we have time for, or comments. Um, so since, since everyone is, uh, has their video off and I can't really see your faces to call on you, um, why don't you just, just chime in if you have a question? And um, if people step over one another, we'll just manage that. Comments or question? I just, I, Sarah, this is Sarah. I was just going to say like, I like your point about like why we don't focus on certain things um because I know that Plymouth Rock is like you go to the Massachusetts that's like that's one of their big things that they're like this is look at the rock that we got so um I think it's interesting that we don't focus on other events like I didn't even know about uh the Native American who did all those wonderful acts like I didn't even realize that he was there so I think people need to open up their eyes a little bit and expand a little bit more upon what's true and what's not and maybe do their own research in that case. Yeah, nicely said. And I, I love what you said about doing your own research. And that's the reason why, um, why I have you do, in addition to those historical interpretation um, analyses, I have you do the primary source interpretations, right? Um, because I think that, again, since history is not the same thing as the past, your interpretation of history um, can legitimately be completely different than mine, right? Um, it, but you need to make up your own mind about that. And to do that, you need to do the research and you need to look at the, at the sources, um, at the primary sources. And I think one of the things that's interesting about monuments is that um, they are not primary sources in a sense that they are someone's construction of the past, right? They are, we can talk about them as primary sources like I did today, but they're really someone's construction, someone's interpretation of the past, um, which is one reason why I think they get so contested so often, right? Any other questions? Well, I thought your comment about um, your discussion of William Byrd was very interesting. I found myself um, quite horrified a couple of weeks ago visiting um, Colonial Williamsburg. They had um, they had someone out portraying um, Landon Carter, mm -hmm. um, who was, of course, of the same sort of caliber and in the same um, elite group as William Byrd and who, who in my opinion, um, did some equally deplorable things to his enslaved population. And I was quite surprised to see uh, an interpreter portraying him at a... Um, living history site because that felt a little bit, it just felt, I mean, you know, and of course, I don't know, I, I would be interested to hear your takes on that because I didn't quite know what to say. Yeah, that's, that's another excellent um, point to make, um, Bryn, thank you. And I think that, I mean, and the thing is, if you don't know, if you, again, to Sarah's point, right, if, if you haven't done a deep dive into the histories of Landon Carter or William Byrd II, how would you know, right? Um, because there is there is the simple story, which is wealthy Virginia gentleman um, who, uh, in the case of William Byrd, collected um, collected lots of books and wrote a very informative history. Um, although you know, again, showing the the racist biases of his time, but um, his you know natural history focused narrative of his journey to the the dividing line between North Carolina and Virginia is is a valuable historical source, but if you start getting into William Byrd II as, as his personal life, um, things get 
sort of messy and complicated. Um, but that's, as you point out, not something that, you know, the Landon Carter, I think, that is at Colonial Williamsburg is not, <laughs> is not the Landon Carter who would, um, you know, whose stories of which would keep children up at night. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a tough decision because, um, you know, and I think it's, it's come out most clearly with um, someone we don't talk about so much in this course because uh, he doesn't really get, in, get important in the American story till after this course parameter. But Thomas Jefferson, I think, is a perfect example of this, right? What do we do with Thomas Jefferson, um, the man who penned the stirring words of the Declaration of Independence about uh, men's equality while holding people enslaved in bondage and having a, um, a controversial then and controversial now relationship with his dead wife's half-sister, whom he also enslaved, Sally Hemings. So I think that um, the fact, though, that, you know, you have William Byrd II, you have Landon Carter, you have Thomas Jefferson, these, these men are, are, in some cases, this, the, the most... Um, the most horrifying thing about them is that they are not, um, they're not unusual in a sense, right? Um, this is, this is in some ways a very American story, which I think is something to be wrestled with. Um, so again, I think that there's a Landon Carter story that you could tell in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but I hope that they're also making an effort to give you the flip side of that. Right. Um, and that's, that, that I think is the conundrum with places like Bird Park. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, you just go and if you if you learn anything about it and you can you know do your own research on this and check it out on the on the internet but uh, <clears throat> it's just mentioned that it's named for William Byrd II who you know who was one of the founders of Richmond and uh, the fact that he owned a lot of the property upon which it was it was established the city nothing is mentioned about um, his really horrible mistreatment of enslaved people nothing is mentioned about his salaciousness, nothing is mentioned about um, the fact that that property that he owned was, you know, dispossessed from indigenous people in the first place. So, you know, I think that there are so many complicated layers to this and that um, one of the things that monuments and uh, whether they take the form of names of parks or, um, or statues, uh, like I said at the beginning, by their nature tend to simplify things um, much more so than the past deserves to be. Um, because I think in the case of something like Plymouth Rock, there is this other story, this inspiring story about religious freedom that we love to think about, right, for good reason, um, that is critically important in the American um, historical experience and narrative. But, you know, why not also, I think we're under an obligation to also tell the other sides of those stories that monuments don't often allow us the, the bandwidth to, to dive into in terms of the complexity. And I'm, I'm just glad I'm not in charge of, of <laughs> running historical interpretation at a, at a colonial site, because I think it would be rife with, with a lot of um, tough decisions. Anyone else have any, have any comments or questions they'd like to, to offer? I would just make comments, Pam. Yes. Hi, Pam. Um, you know, we, we perpetrate um, uh, myths in school, especially, you know, starting at the elementary school. So, you know, where do we start to correct history? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think one of the the problems is that um, you know if, if you're if you're an elementary school teacher, for example, like if if you're teaching Columbus in kindergarten, how do you tell kindergartners the real story of Columbus without horrifying them? Right? I mean, that's a lot of the stories that cause people to do things like splash red paint on Columbus are not age appropriate for five and six year olds. Uh, so what, you know, what do we do with that? And I think that, um, that again, there are, um, these are complicated questions in terms of how you approach them. Um, but I think to start, um, you know, in elementary schools, for example, why not make more of an effort to um, tell stories of, Pope alongside stories of Puritans, right? Um, so there, there are ways you don't you don't necessarily have to dive straight into um, the brutal ugliness of colonial history in its most terrifying iterations in order to tell a more inclusive history. I think um, so. I personally think that's one way to do it. Um, so you know, I'd, I'd be interested actually, in, and maybe we can pick this up next week um, to discuss you know how how you all would would do this, how you would. Um, you know, how, how and whether this course has, has changed how you would choose to um, talk about the history of Thanksgiving with your family, for example. Um, 
So, you know, I think that these are, these are important questions. And I think that um, how, how and why we choose to include things in our history is vitally important, regardless of the level of education at which you're talking. Um, and I think that a lot of Americans emerge from our system of education um, due to a variety of factors, right? Everything from curriculum standards to teaching to tests um, to the accident of where you go to college um, and whose classes you take. Um, but we end up, I think, that's why so many of us still think about history as it's presented through these historical interpretations, through historic sites and monuments and museums. And those places, by the way, monument uh, museums and historic sites are doing some of the most cutting edge historical interpretation out there. Um, Colonial Williamsburg, for example, um, you know, in addition to Landon Carter, which is a dubious, <laughs> a dubious choice, also does fantastic groundbreaking work on history of enslavement um, in colonial America. So, you know, I think that what personally, what I would say is, um, you know, include as much history as possible. Um, so have newspaper rock alongside Plymouth Rock, right? Um, and, you know, maybe maybe have have a statue of De Las Casas um, or De Vaca, um, you know, talking to Columbus just as they uh, they were in a sort of dialogue um, in the, the 15th and 16th century, right? Um, in, the, in the case of De Las Casas um, reacting to policies put in place by Columbus and his conquest of the Caribbean. But so I also hope that this has um, given you more food for thought in terms of putting um, Trio's book in its broader context um, because he's talking about Haiti. Um, but, you know, I think that the the moral of his stories can be applied to our discussion of the colonial American past. So any final words before, um, before I end, I end this, this Q and A. Yeah. Um, I have a, this is the other Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I have a question on, you know, the four paintings in the rotunda. Yeah. Um, I was just kind of wondering maybe how you think they should be handled. Cause I'm sure there's some people who would support removal while others would prefer acknowledgement mm -hmm. um, of, you know, the inaccuracy and the incorrect celebrations. Um, I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge it because, you know, to tourism is, you know, a really important form of education. Right, right. Yeah, and actually, and, um, you know, John Vanderlyn, for example, is 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 a great painter. I mean, you know, his his paintings are um, are renowned for their for their skill and in, in artistry and beauty. So, yeah, I mean, to your point, um, you know, a, a lot of the, both the Confederate monument um, controversy, for example, a lot of those statues are artistic trash, essentially, right? They're, they're hollow, they're made out of um, sort of, they're sort of cheap, cheap metal statues that are turned out mostly in the beginning of the 20th century. So it's different to talk about, um, from an artistic standpoint, something like um, Silent Sam at UNC Chapel Hill, being toppled versus uh, slashing and burning a Vandalin painting, right? What do you do with that? When you bring in the element of, of artistry, I think it, it does create some problems. One answer that I think is really fascinating is that um, contemporary artists have taken to creating works of art that directly speak to and protest against paintings, including the landing of Columbus. Um, and they are black artists um, overwhelmingly. And I think that their work, which has been um, housed in museums and galleries, um, really is a, is a fabulous way to, um, to both allow the original work of art to, to stay, but also speak to, um, speak to its limitations and its problems um, and the violence it does to the histories of um, indigenous and black people in particular. So I think in the, in the landing of Columbus has been the subject of exactly um, that type of artistic uh, pushback, which I think is really helpful because I think that um, sometimes people just don't know the histories of these, of these complicated um, complex uh, historical artifacts and people. Um, and I think that, that discussion and education is the first step to correcting that, right? Um, I mean, I think, say what you will about the 1619 Project, it has gotten people discussing Jamestown and the history of slavery in colonial America in ways that um, I think most of us would agree um, have, not, have not been as, as widely done um, in years, right, if ever. And so I think that, that art like that in the, in the rotunda, um, if it's, if it's, if the counter interpretation is presented properly, could really um, be a powerful pedagogical tool. But again, not, not an easy, not an easy question to answer, right? Yeah. 
Well, so I think with that, unless anyone has any any parting words, um, I'm going to to end this this session and say um, that I'm really looking forward to hearing next week uh, what what you all think about um, myths and monuments, and also how your conception of what colonial American history is has changed um, throughout the course of this class. Um, and you know, I think that that each of you has has shown really fantastic. Um, fantastic ways of wrestling with the complexities of the past. And, um, and I think that considering how we choose to memorialize and celebrate um, colonial American history, which elements of it, whose history and why are things that I hope that you don't stop. Um, you don't stop thinking about. So um, thank you so much. And I will see you all next week. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Afterwards podcast. This week, our guest is Ben Shapiro, talking about his book, The Authoritarian Moment. He argues that the progressive left is pushing an authoritarian agenda on America. Find it and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.